In recent years, we've heard a lot of claims about election fraud, from they're hacking into the machines and changing the numbers remotely, to some guys just showed up with boxes of ballots, brought them into the polling sites, and they counted them. So today, let's talk about election security that we have here in New York State, and what's done to prevent voting fraud and election tampering. Let's start with New York's paper ballots. This is a sample ballot from my last local election. A real ballot would not have the word sample, and there would be black boxes around the edges that help the scanner identify and read the ballot. So no, you can't just download the sample ballot, edit out the word sample, and print out stacks of fake ballots. Voting on these is like the tests that many of us took in school, where you fill in the bubble corresponding to the candidate you choose. When you're done, you shove it into a scanner that reads and validates it. Validates. What's that entail? Sometimes people will touch a pen to the selection circle, but not fill it in like they were considering the candidate. What if that's the only circle in that race with any mark? What if another candidate is properly selected? What was the voter's intention? Validation isn't so much security as avoiding another mess like in Florida in 2000. Now, they were using punch cards, not scan ballots. But during the recount in the close presidential race, there was a debate over cards that weren't fully punched, or the punched out portion was still dangling, and whether that meant the voter intended to choose a particular candidate. We don't want a repeat of the pregnant and dangling chads seen in Florida, so the scanner validates that each circle is entirely empty or completely filled, thus avoiding the confusion and the fight about it after the fact. If the scanner finds a problem, it returns the ballot for correction. If the voter didn't fully fill in the circles they wanted, they can correct this and try again with the same ballot. If they left marks on unintended candidates, they must spoil their ballot. The spoiled ballot is sealed in an envelope and kept by poll workers for later accounting. And the voter gets a fresh ballot to choose again, being careful not to leave confusing marks this time. The scanner also checks for overvoting. In this family court race, for example, I'm allowed to vote for up to two candidates. I can abstain, that is, not vote for anyone, or I can vote for one or two candidates. But if I vote for three or more, the machine will tell me that I voted wrong. My options are to cast the ballot as is and have my invalid choice in that race ignored. Or I can have my ballot returned to me so that I can request a new one and correct the problem on a new ballot. As ballots are accepted by the scanner, the machine tallies the choices in each race. At the end of day, the machine generates a report of the number of ballots cast and the number of votes for each of the candidates in each of the races. Let's talk about the poll workers who collect and transport that report. Poll workers have a long day. They arrive before polls open, hang up the signs and the flag, arrange the room, power up the machines, inventory supplies, and make sure there's no ballots cast yet. Throughout the day, they check people in, give them ballots, and provide assistance if there are questions. At the end of day, poll workers take down their signs, audit ballot counts, pack up the machines, and deliver the ballots and results to the Board of Elections. And throughout the day, they also ensure the validity of the polling and the results. How? Let's go into that. First, think about when you arrive at your polling place. There's often a greeter like at Walmart. Somebody else checks you in looking up your name in the district roster. An assistant hands you a ballot. A second person whose role is just handing you a sheet of paper. And there's somebody else whose sole job seems to be handing out stickers that say, I voted today. Your polling site looks like some kind of jobs project with way more workers than is actually necessary. There are indeed a few extra staff because given the super long day, poll workers will need to step out and stretch their legs, take a bathroom break, get lunch, or even go home sick. But the bigger deal is that half those workers are Democrat. The other half, are Republican. If the one who signs you in is a Democrat, then the one who hands you the ballot is a Republican, or vice versa. 
They're keeping an eye on each other, making sure nobody's cheating. If you have a question about something, you'll be assisted by two people, one Republican, one Democrat. Again, they are checking each other to make sure you're being helped and not pressured to vote a particular way. Anything sensitive is done by one of these bipartisan teams, one Democrat, one Republican, so that neither side can rig the result and to ensure everybody's honest. All those poll workers are also needed at the start and end of the day during setup and takedown. Each machine is set up and taken down by, you guessed it, a bipartisan team. The setup team checks the machine's start of day report to make sure that the vote counts are zeroed out. They also check the tamper evidence seals on the machine to ensure that they are intact, showing that the machine hasn't been tampered with. And they check that the machine is properly closed and locked so that cast ballots can't be tampered with during the day. Meanwhile, another bipartisan team inventories the ballots. If there are multiple districts or precincts, then each district gets inventoried separately by a different bipartisan team. Districts are told how many ballots they should receive, and each team checks that they actually received the correct number. None missing, no extras. If you've ever worked as a cashier, this will sound familiar. At the start of your shift, you might start with, say, $100 and change. If you ring up receipts of, say, $200, then at the end of the day, your drawer better have $300 in there. If not, something's wrong. It's the same thing with ballots, but let's go over an example. Suppose a district has 250 blank pre-printed ballots at the start of day. Through the day, three people make mistakes and request new ballots. Their original ballots aren't just thrown out. They are placed in sealed, spoiled ballot envelopes and kept by the district. At the end of day, Machine 1 reports scanning 57 ballots for that district. Machine 2 scanned another 44 for a total of 101 ballots cast. The district inventories the remaining supplies, finding 146 unused ballots. Three spoiled ballots, plus 101 cast, plus 146 unused, equals 250 ballots, the same number we had at the start of the day. All ballots are accounted for, no extras, none missing. What if there were only 145 ballots? After rechecking inventory, it would show that one went missing. Perhaps somebody decided not to vote or received an emergency phone call and took off with their ballot. I've never seen it happen when working elections for me, but I'm told that it occasionally does. And when it does, a ballot goes missing. What if there were 153 unused ballots? Now there's a problem. Now we have 257 ballots at the end of the day. Where'd those extra seven come from? I've never seen or heard of this happening, but if it did, it would indicate a problem. The point is that when you hear claims that extra ballots were injected into the voting system and nobody knows the least bit of difference until weeks or months later, at least here in New York State, that's a load of bull. If at the end of the day, poll workers had a whole bunch of extra ballots cast or missing, they might not know where they came from or where they went. But even before leaving the polling site, they'd know that there was a problem, the nature of the problem, and the scale of the problem. In the event of a serious accounting issue during ballot reconciliation, poll workers would call the Board of Elections to ask for help, and an expert would be dispatched to assist and look for math errors or other correctable problems, or to investigate what went wrong and why ballots showed up from nowhere or went missing. Ballot reconciliation at the end of day ensures that there are no extra ballots, no major shortage of ballots, and that the number of ballots cast is recorded so that in the event of a recount, workers can ensure they have the correct number of ballots for the recount and that none have been lost or added since election day. When voting machines are shut down at the end of day, the tamper evidence seals are rechecked to make sure nothing was tampered with during the day. One of those seals ensures the machine's memory cards can't be tampered with. If it was, the seal would be broken. Each seal is stamped with a unique number, so you can't just cut the seal off and replace it with a new one. 
the numbers won't match, so tampering will still be evident. The image cast voting machines we use in Monroe County and much of New York don't have Wi-Fi, so they can't be remotely hacked that way. But even if the counts were tampered with, the original ballots are still collected in a box in the machine. They can, and a randomly selected portion are, recounted at a later date to verify that the counts the machine recorded at the polling site match the choices on the ballots. And in the event of a tight race, a full manual recount is done. Once the machines are shut down and the ballots reconciled, everything needs to go to the Board of Elections. After checking the seal numbers on each machine's memory card compartment to ensure that there's been no tampering, a bipartisan team cuts the seals and removes the two memory cards. From each machine, one card and one printed copy of the machine's tallies are put into a security bag, like for a night deposit at a bank, and sealed with a tamper-evident closure with another unique number. Next, the boxes with the cast ballots are removed from each machine, and into each is placed the machine's second memory card, along with the second printed copy of the machine's tallies. Spoiled ballots and other sensitive paperwork go in with the ballots too. Now, the two secure parcels with tamper-evident seals are taken to a collection point. One bag is transported by a Democrat, the other by a Republican. And when arriving at the collection point, they're taken away to the next phase by, what do you know, another bipartisan team. On election night, the Board of Elections uses the memory cards and printed reports to aggregate the results. Bipartisan teams of one Democrat, one Republican, tally up results and verify each other's totals. What we just covered is for polling on election day. We also have early voting here in New York, which is a little bit different. There are a limited number of early voting locations, so instead of dealing with pre-printed ballots, they print ballots on demand based on a voter's district. How does that get reconciled? It's very similar. Poll workers inventory the supply of blank printer ballots instead of pre-printed ballots at the start of day. At the end of day, they recount inventory. The number of blank ballots remaining plus the number of cast ballots and spoiled ballots should equal the count from start of day. Additionally, a count of voters who signed in is kept usually by the tablet they sign in on. At end of day, the voter count and spoiled ballot counts recorded by the sign-in tablet should equal the number of ballots cast and spoiled ballots collected. There is talk in New York about moving to touchscreen voting. Instead of marking a pre-printed ballot with a pen, you'll vote on a tablet, which will print a ballot with your choices. You'll then put the machine-printed ballot into a scanner or perhaps a collection box for central scanning later. This would save the trouble, cost, and waste of pre-printed ballots. Should this come to pass, there will still be ballot reconciliation, and it will probably resemble closely that of today's early voting. So that's day of election security. It's like some folks do this for a job and have thought through the security and built procedures and methods to make election fraud difficult and evident if it does happen. So what's to prevent people from just photocopying ballots and mailing them in by the hundreds? When you submit an absentee ballot, you don't just mail it in anonymously. There's a special envelope you have to fill out that identifies you, the voter. The Board of Elections knows who applied for absentee ballots, and they keep track of who returned them. They're not going to count ballots that show up in anonymous envelopes. If they get an absentee ballot from someone who has never sent one, that's going to get flagged for investigation. If multiple absentee ballots are returned from the same person, that's also going to get flagged. But what about the League of Dead Voters? Aren't they out there voting absentee by the thousands? County Vital Statistics records all deaths in the county. That information is given to the State Health Department, which in turn passes death information on to the relevant Board of Elections. Similarly, the state communicates address changes from the Department of Motor Vehicles to the Board of Elections. Additionally, the Post Office maintains an electronic address change database. Every February, 
This list is used to update the voter roster. Subsequently, the Board of Elections mails everybody a postcard telling you your polling site in case it's changed. Note this mail is marked Return Service Requested. This directs the post office to return to sender instead of forwarding. The returned mail includes the forwarding address, if known, so the Board of Elections can update their files accordingly. As you can see, there are multiple redundant ways the Board of Elections knows about voters who have moved or passed on. Angry allegations of stolen elections, most often spread by those who don't like the outcome, really don't sound so credible when we know the details, do they? Is fraud possible? If Crazy John defers reporting his mom's death and shoves her in a freezer till after the election, might he get away with filing an absentee ballot as his mom? Well, maybe, but how often is that really going to happen? Or at the risk of giving the conspiracy theorists new fodder, do you think there's a warehouse out there filled with freezers of dead parents in numbers sufficiently large to swing the election, and nobody has noticed, nor has anybody spilled the beans? Come on, folks, let's get real. So what about live voters? Couldn't somebody just show up with a busload of immigrants and have them vote? Here in New York State, no. You must register to vote in advance, and the Board of Elections verifies that registrants are citizens before adding them to the roster. On election day, if you're not on that roster, you don't get to vote on the machine. Instead, you can complete an affidavit ballot, which is similar to a mail-in ballot in that your ballot goes into an envelope that identifies you, the voter, so eligibility can be assessed before the ballot is counted. But that determination is made by the Board of Elections after Election Day, not by the on-site poll workers. Could someone vote using another's name? If they know a name that's on the roster, they could try. Say, Lisa. What if Lisa's already voted? It won't work. What if our hypothetical fraudster votes and then the real Lisa comes in later? The problem would be detected. And remember that seeming excess of poll workers we talked about earlier? There's usually a few locals from the area being canvassed. They may not know everyone in the district, but between them, they know a fair number of people in the poll book. There's a good chance somebody will know that our fraudster isn't really Lisa. Once again, fraudulently voting is not as easy as it sounds. Different states have different election systems. If your state has paper ballots, then they may do things a lot like New York. If you vote on a machine that prints a little receipt with your choices and a barcode or QR code that you then stick into a second machine or a collection box, that may be quite similar too. They're just using a machine to mark and print the ballot instead of a pen, and the second machine does the counting, and the receipts can still be recounted manually or by machine if necessary. If you're in one of those states where you vote on a touchscreen machine or a button panel, make your choices and hit a button that says cast and your votes disappear into the machine, I have no idea how that can be trusted. Without paper ballots to provide an audit trail, eh, what happens to your vote if the machine craps out after you voted? Eh. Here, the paper ballots could be recounted. Without paper ballots, eh. If you live in one of the states with those machines, when they come up for replacement, you might want to get that fixed. I'm not saying there is fraud in those states, there's surely some safeguards there too, but I find knowing that the machine is just a tabulation assistant for a human-readable stack of papers offers a sense of assurance. I'd love to know how other states handle election security, so if you've worked polls outside New York, tell us in the comments what's similar and what's different for election security in your state. So maybe by now you're getting the sense that elections aren't a thing where the first Tuesday of November every year, some folks wake up and say, all right, let's wing this. There's planning and thought that's been put into this, and surely it's been refined year over year. In recent years, there have been claims about election fraud and stolen elections. If you've never been involved in the process, you might have wondered, is it possible? How would I know? Why couldn't extra ballots have been injected into the system? I hope this video has explained why that's not easy to achieve. Bipartisan teams throughout the process, ballot accounting and reconciliation to make sure nothing is appearing or disappearing unexpectedly, paper ballots so machine counts can be verified by hand if desired. 
If this video has been helpful in alleviating your worries and wonders about election fraud, give it a like and share it with others that need to hear it. But let's be realistic. The cries of fraud are not going to stop, no matter what we do. Whether it's a crybaby candidate who can't accept that he's lost, or conspiracy theorists who don't like the outcome, there are plenty of troublemakers ready to make up lies and spread them around, even after they've been debunked. I hope this video will at least slow some of it down, that liberty and democracy may continue to bless our lives for years to come.